Uh, my name is Taylor Shear. Me and my wife Cassidy have the honor and privilege of heading up the local church. Tonight, I'm going to talk about pain. Pain. And, and I, I want to just bring an outlook into pain that maybe you haven't thought of before. It's, it's, when I say pain, it's immediately a negative uh, connotation to the word. But I want to just change your perspective a little bit tonight on pain and, and how to use it, how, when you experience it, how to deal with it, and then how to implement it and use it as a safeguard and as a, a, a teacher in your life. So let's pray real quick. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house under your name to hear your word. Lord, we don't take that lightly. Lord, we thank you for the, the freedom that we have in the United States of America to be able to come in and worship God freely. Lord, I thank you that you be with my mouth. Lord, I think that they're your words and not mine. Lord, I thank you that it hits every person where they sit, how they need to hear it. And Lord, I thank you that, that as we sit tonight, that you bring up for remembrance in everyone's mind, Lord, different situations and different things that we can learn from. And Lord, I thank you that we can implement it and make our lives better. Lord, I thank you that on this stage that I decrease so that you could increase. Lord, and then we replicate that in our lives. That every day, Lord, that we decrease so that you could increase. Lord, we love you, we worship you, and I thank you for the St. Louis Blues tonight. Be with them. Help them put the puck in the net more than the Sharks and that they win game three and then we move on to Stanley Cup. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Go, Blues. Go Blues. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, man. It is uh, it's a fun time in sports. So, okay, we're talking about pain. Psalm 69, and we're going to read verses 29 and 30. And this is out of the Message Bible. It says, I am hurt and in pain. Give me space for healing in mountain air. Let me shout God's name with a praising song. Let me tell his greatness in a prayer of thanks. So the definition of pain by Webster's Dictionary says that it's a physical suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injury. And, and we live in a, a society that comfort is so high on the priority list that it, it's, I feel like we've lost what pain is and, and what it is for us. But we view pain as an enemy when, in fact, we should view it as a friend. When, in fact, we should view it as as an informer, as a teacher or a trainer, not as an enemy. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not make a mistake when he made us. And, and pain is something that we are going to experience. So I, I want you to know and sit with the confidence that when the Lord made you, there was pain that was going was gonna to happen that you were going to have to endure. You can endure it. It will not beat you. You have been made to handle those situations and to handle that pain. But pain is not an enemy, it's in fact a friend. Pain is an overall emotion. So as I, I look back and I read through the Webster's Dictionary that says it's a physical suffering or discomfort. What I found so interesting about that is those are two very, very different things when it comes to severity. That you have a suffering and then a discomfort. Pain is the overall uh, umbrella for that feeling, that emotion that you, you experience. And it goes everything in the spectrum from a, a slight discomfort to physical suffering. There's a difference between pain and discomfort. So in, uh, in life growing up, like I said, it's a miracle that I turned out halfway normal um, Living with my dad, I mean, the joke that we have is that we had a green truck that he called Old Blue, and um, that was normal for some reason. But I grew up, and, and I, I can say that 
seeing the 20 or being with dad for the 26 years that we've had the church that he is the exact same on stage that he is at home uh, that he is in the office that he is driving down the road and as a kid is it's exhausting that he's like that but it, it, I look at it now and I'm so happy and so thankful of who he was and he would say this there were uh, times he coached me I played every sport growing up and he was the coach which was most people would be like oh I guess nowadays it would be well your dad's a coach so you get to play all the time it was not awesome dad being the coach he was harder on me uh more more difficult and and while I hated it then I, I'm now very thankful but he would ask me this question every time that I would have some sort of injury, he would say, are you injured or are you hurt? Are you injured or are you hurt? Those are two very, very different things. Are you injured or are you hurt? I want to come back to pain being a, a friend or a coach or an informer. Because here's what pain tells you. Pain tells you, to stop, look, and listen. That's what pain tells you to do. That's what our, our, our body is made to handle pain in that. Like you walk up to a stove, if you, put your, you barely touch the stove, you are going to feel pain on your hand. Now the, the impulse or the, the thing that that pain is telling you is to remove your hand from said stove. It would be very, very bad if you were just to leave your hand on that stove. So when going through life, when you experience things and when you go through situations that bring you pain, use that as a, as a coach and as a friend and as a, a, a way of learning and informing on how to move forward or how not to move forward. I think what's hard is, like I said, in society, we live in a, a comfort that we, we like a certain comfort level. We like things to be just how they are. And, and if it's a little bit off that causes a little bit of discomfort, I'm going to stay away from it. When that, that is not necessarily what it's supposed to be. That pain is a, a trainer and a guideline. It's just like the sirens. When you're driving down the road and you hear a siren, you know that it is an emergency vehicle. And what do you do? Or should do? You should pull over to the side of the road and stop and let them pass by. That's what pain is. It's that siren or, or the, you see the arms come down as you're passing the, tra the railroad tracks. You know a train is coming through. It is warning you of what is to come. That's exactly what pain is. The situation or events that you have gone through are not responsible for how you feel. The situation or the events are not responsible for how you feel. I know that you were hurt. I know that whatever that person in authority said about you when you were a kid, and it has stuck with you for so long, and you've let that hurt just fester up inside of you for however many years, that does not define you. It is not responsible for how you feel or the confidence that you have. So I come back to are you hurt or are you injured? So growing up, uh, like I said, my dad was, was my coach. I was in third grade, and um, third grade was a very traumatic year for me, I'm learning. That's also the year that I broke my arm, and my dad said I didn't, and then I walked around for a month, no exaggeration, a month with a broken arm, and, uh, but we were out riding bikes, and it was uh, after school and before we had a, a baseball game. And we were riding around, and um, the Barnes lived next door to us, and Dylan plays guitar here for us, and they had, uh, a, Drew was my age, and Dylan was a year younger, and we would always ride bikes and do very stupid stuff, but we were kids, and it was fun, and uh, we weren't, we were still minors, so it was, most of the stuff was okay in our mind, but um, we're riding bikes, and they had the foundation in the house next to the Barnes. And we're riding our bikes on that foundation. Now there was, it was all clean, smooth, it was awesome. You could do so many tricks in your head, not in real life. I was not really the risk taker. Like I had to count to three like ten times before I would ride my bike and hit a jump. That was me. I'm just going to be very clear with you. Not try to be a tough guy. I don't like it. Um, not a big fan of heights either. I'll be honest. I don't like heights. That's for a reason. 
It's a long fall. I feel like that's the Lord protecting me, but that's beside the point. So we're riding around, and there was this pile of bricks uh, just off to the side, and they were all laid down very, very smooth in a flat surface, except for one, that the corner of it was sticking up. So I was going to do a, uh, a trick. We set up this ramp, and I was going to jump those, that pile of bricks. Like I said, I'm not a daredevil. That's not me. Talk myself into it. Here we go. Everybody's watching. Everyone's watching. They're going to judge me if I don't do this. So I go. I don't fully commit to said jump. I bail. I land on it, find the one brick that the corner was sticking up straight through my knee. Third grade. Makes you 10 years old, I think. Right? Eight years old. We'll say eight. Eight years old. Makes the story better. So eight years old, and I have this massive gash in my leg. Now, at eight years old, whatever sport I was in was everything to me. And I knew that I had a game that night. So I run upstairs at eight years old. My mom's downstairs. Dad isn't home yet. I make it upstairs. I unroll an entire roll of toilet paper. In my mind, this is going to (laughs) work. It's it, no question if it's going to work, and no one is going to notice. So I have a whole roll of toilet paper. I try to stick it on. It doesn't stay on my leg. Blood is everywhere. Not good. But I have a baseball game, okay? There's no one else that can play the sixth position. No one else can play shortstop for our team. I have to make sure that I'm ready to go. Put it on. Not sticking. What do I do? There's duct tape in the garage. Boom. Down the stairs in the garage. Mom has no idea what's going on. It's awesome. I think I'm getting away with it. It's like an Italian job, how I'm sliding in, and I I get it on my leg, and I I tape it up. I start walking around like everything's great. I walk in the house. First thing mom says, what happened to your leg? What do you mean? Nothing here. Ignore this literal entire roll of toilet paper unraveled on my leg. So I would then play it off. Didn't work. She said, well, your dad's about to be home. He's going to take you to the urgent care, and you're going to get stitches. This is the second time I've had stitches. They're not awesome. For those of you that don't know, when you have a cut, they come in, they clean that cut out before they numb it, which makes no sense. Still cannot figure that out. I got hit by a hockey puck about a year ago, and they could not get it clean. And and it was the most miserable pain I I have experienced. It's terrible. It's an open wound that they're scrubbing. Anyways, so they clean it. Then they put a shot into it to numb it. That is the worst pain of getting stitches. So I've already been through it. I don't want to do it. I'm like, no, no, it's good. It's going to stop bleeding soon. Take it off. It's a massive gash. No, you're going. So dad uh, throws me in the truck. We head to urgent care. All while, this is very, very much my dad. I was in my baseball uniform at this point. So I was ready to go. There were no questions if I was going to play or not. I went to go get stitches. So we go in, and this is just a little glimpse into my childhood. Uh, I knew I'd already had stitches before. I knew I didn't like it. I knew it hurt. And he's <laughs> so dad. But he walks up, and he goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. Every time that they put that needle into that wound, and they hit it, and it hurts, you're going to say, "Woohoo! thank you, sir. This is not a joke. This is real life. I'm in urgent care if I had eight stitches at that point, so I had eight shots. Woohoo! Thank you, sir. Every single one of them. The doctor had to think that, who is this loony tune right here? Like, he's out of control. And dad's going, yep, that's right. That's my boy. I'm like, I don't know if this is helping. But here's what's interesting about that. They dress everything up. They get the stitches in, they put the bandage on it, they wrap it up. We get in the car, and Dad asked me, you good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. Are you hurt or are you injured? I'm just hurt. Because you can play hurt. And I want to give you a word of encouragement in life. No matter what you've experienced, no matter what has come, no matter what you have faced, or no matter how... People have tried to attack you or the enemy has tried to attack you. It has not killed you. You are here, so it has not killed you. You are not injured. You are just hurt. 
I understand that things happen. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around how it feels or what it's like to go through a lot of situations. But I can give you this encouragement. That that pain is a teacher. Now, is it, if you are in a relationship and there is a bad breakup, it's a bad situation. You go into another one. Is that saying to not open up or to not become vulnerable or not to get in another relationship? No, that is not what it's saying. But maybe you should develop yourself and make sure that you are a whole person and who God has called you to be. And then go into that situation where you are still guarding your heart. You use those, uh, those experiences and those situations where that pain has come in. And you use it as an informer, as a friend, or as a trainer. The situation or events aren't responsible for how you feel or how you behave. Psalm 119.71. He says, my suffering was good for me. For it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. My suffering was good for me. For it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Pain is corrective. Pain is corrective. It's not enjoyable. But it's a learning process. It's a a part of the development. It, it, It happens... In the potter's house, when the father is is remolding clay vessels, and that's what we are. We are those clay vessels that are are set out with calls that are uncommon. But he's molding us and and shaping us, and that, that pain is corrective. That pain is to fix things. Also, I want you to know that to not... Don't misunderstand those hurting seasons. Don't misunderstand the times when you feel pain. Because it's birthing the healing process. It's birthing the healing process. I think what's hard is we go through life and we experience things and we don't want to show that it bothers us or that it hurts us or that it brings us pain. So we just hide it and and we, we keep it down and we cover it up so that nobody can see it. But yet, it's still there. So at some point through life, whether it be weeks, months, years, decades go by, something is going to happen that pulls a scab off of that wound. And then all of a sudden, it's this big way of a bigger thing that you have to deal with. When in all reality, if you would have just given it to God and given that situation to God, you wouldn't have had to deal with it. But again, what's hard is that first sign of pain, boom, we turn around and we run. Now here's why I say that pain is a friend or a teacher. I am not saying that when you are are going through life and you're going down the road and you experience pain to just push through it. No, that pain may be to stop you from going into an absolute car wreck or, or a train wreck that could ruin your life. That it just makes you stop, look, and listen. Too many times we get going too fast and we push through. It's like, oh, that's just some resistance. That's fine. I'm going to keep moving, keep moving. When in all reality, that pain was brought for you just to stop, to look to God, to listen listen for his voice, and get direction in that. To find that peace. To not just keep going through every red flag. And you're just saying, no, this is pain. This is just... Uh, it's just opposition. That's all this is. No, that pain is to have you stop, look, and listen. It might be for you to keep pressing forward and just push on. It might just be a little bit of, of discomfort. But it might also be a warning to stop you from heading down the wrong path or heading down the wrong way in life. So here I have five things that pain forces you to do. Five things. Number one... Pain forces you to look to the word for answers. Friends are great. Family is great. They don't have the answers. Pain forces you to look to the word, the word of God, for answers. Number two, pain forces you to rely on God instead of man. Men will let you down. Men will fail you. God will not. 
Number three, pain forces you to learn from your mistakes. To learn from your mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes in life, but I will tell you this. I have learned from most of them. I might make a mistake. I'm not going to make it twice. That is the, it's, I would say the one thing I, I stand on now, and marriage is phenomenal. But I have to remind Cass, I'm a guy, literally, and, and this has come out of my, my mouth a few times, but I'm like, you know, I didn't do that just to make you mad. I know you thought I did, but I didn't. I appreciate you thinking that I'm thinking that far ahead, but I am not. I am in the moment. For instance, uh, taking the trash out. I'm really good at taking the trash out. Not so good at putting trash bags back in the can. Okay? I'm going to be honest. I'm not great at it. I'm okay with it. Sometimes I tell her that I locked all the doors before I came to bed just because I don't want to get up. Oops. The alarm's set. What does it matter? We're good. We're good. But no, it, it's, I learned from my mistakes. I've, I'm, I'm not doing things just to upset you. I am not thinking that far ahead. You literally just tell me what to do, and I will do that. I am really good at doing what I'm told to do. Well, I don't want to have to tell you. Yeah, but you're going to have to once. And then I'll learn. Sometimes. Most of the time. But in life, we have to learn from our mistakes. Quit making the same mistakes. If you keep putting yourself in situations for you to make the same repetitive mistake, find a new situation. If you're dealing with addiction, stay away from whatever situation is going to lead you to that. Put some parameters in, in, your, in your life where it's set up. I remember being in high school, and, and one, of the, one of the deals in our small groups, one of the guys said, man, I, I just don't want to mess around. I, I don't want to sleep with my girlfriend. And I remember Chris Hart, plain as day, looked over and he goes, well, quit going to your bedroom then. And we all laughed, but it's so true. Quit putting yourselves in situations for you to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. As I, I, I'm in an amazing marriage and I have great kids, I, I remember when we found out we were pregnant with Charleston, I made sure that I started getting stuff in line, closing doors that were open, making sure that I tightened down the hatches because I was bringing a child into this world. And I was for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, it was a boy. We don't find out what we're having. My barbaric wife, the baby, Charleston, is halfway out, and she reaches down and pulls the rest of her out. I'm like, <laughs> at this point, just so you guys know, I am at her shoulder facing the other way. I'm not trying to see anything at this point. I miss the good old days when husbands waited in the waiting room. Can we bring that back, please? Because apparently we're going to have six of them. So I got four more of those. But I, I remember coming out and I'm like, okay, Taylor, announce the gender. I'm a talker. This is what I'm called to do. I couldn't find a word to say. Not a word. I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? It's obvious. But I remember feeling this, uh, I mean, unimaginable amount of weight that fell on me. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have a daughter now. I'm responsible for how she turns out. I'm the protector of my home. When there is a girl going wild, they don't say, oh man, she has mommy issues. It's daddy issues. I'm like, I I got to figure some stuff out. But that's what we need to do in life. Close the doors. Pain is going to come. Pain is going to happen. Quit bringing it on yourself. 
Quit putting yourselves in situations where you're going to trip, fall, and scrape your knee up. Start walking how you're supposed to walk and talking how you're supposed to talk. Be around the right people and don't put yourself in situations that are just asking you to, fa to fail. Number four, pain forces you to want, to need for his presence and his healing. That hurt deep, deep down that nobody knows about, God does. And he is the healer. Last night I spoke about the power of your words, and I would use it for this, that life and death are in the power of your tongue. So whatever the circumstances are, whatever the situation is, it might feel like it's out of your control, but it's not out of God's control. Start speaking to those situations and speaking life into them and watch how God starts changing the circumstances in that situation for your good. Things that look bleak, things that look like there are no, there's no chance that that is going to work out. And watch how God steps in and changes everything just because you spoke life into that situation. Quit talking about the situation. Talk to the situation. Talk to the issue and speak life into that. But pain forces you to need and to want for his presence and his healing. And number five, pain forces you to listen to the still, small voice. Life is chaotic. There is noise everywhere. But pain forces you to sit, to get with God and to listen to that still small voice, to listen for the direction, to see the, the, the red flags that are in front of you, the checks that are in front of you, to feel those, but then also to slow down to feel the peace that he's put into the situation or into that decision. So pain forces you to look to the word for answers. It forces you to rely on God instead of man. It forces you to learn from your mistakes to want or need for his presence and healing. And it forces you to listen to the still, small voice. Romans 8, 18, at the New Living Translation said, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Whatever you're going through, whatever pain you're feeling, whatever suffering, discomfort that you're feeling, no matter where it's at on the pain scale, it is nothing compared to the glory that he's going to reveal to us later. You're going to look back at this situation and you're going to be thankful because of what came out of it. If you're in a situation that it feels like absolute suffering, start speaking to that situation. Put demands on that situation. I experienced something a, a few months back that rocked me. I mean, it, it unlike anything I had ever experienced. It brought so much pain. It, it was unbelievable. But I'll tell you what it forced me to do. It forced me to deal with what I needed to deal with, to get with God, and to speak to that situation. I said, Lord, this situation is going to serve me. It's not going to be something that defines me. It's not going to be something that I'm going to have to deal with later on. But I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to be better from this. I'm going to be a better husband from this situation, a better father, a better leader, a better friend. But this situation is going to serve me. That's a word for somebody. That whatever situation you're going through, it might feel like suffering. It might feel like there is no end in sight. Speak life into that situation and demand that that situation serves you. The enemy cannot win. If he could, he already would have. He's going to throw those haymakers. The first time it hits you, you might get knocked down. Get back up. The next time it hits you, you might just stumble back. And then all of a sudden, you're looking at it thinking, that is all you have? That doesn't even affect me anymore. That doesn't break stride anymore. 
because you're developing into the man or woman of God that God's called you to be. So demand that those situations serve you, develop you, that you learn from it, and that you're able then to return to help people through situations like that. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that it is alive and it is true. Lord, I thank you that as we sit uh, under your word, Lord, that you revealed to us things in our lives that, that we need to remove, that we need to add. Lord, I thank you that we shut doors. Lord, I thank you that we just, as we sit here now, that you're revealing things to us and we're taking inventory of our lives. And Lord, you're showing us situations that we have, have conceded at this point. But Lord, I thank you that those situations that we speak life into them. Lord, I thank you that your hand is at work. And Lord, I thank you that we learn from those situations. Lord, we demand that those situations serve us in becoming the best possible us that we can be.